Good afternoon and welcome to UMAT TV. My name is Kamal Arkin. Today is September 8th, 2023. Uh, our weekly events and today is uh, where we actually cover the uh, wellness webinar. And we discuss uh, diabetes and the issues related to diabetes and how we can actually better manage uh, this uh, chronic illness that many people are dealing with day to day. Um, as many of you already know, the pro our program is one of the um, uh, accredited diabetes center in Delaware, maybe the only private one, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Caroline Weber is our uh, manager for the program, and usually we have one of our guests uh, who covers the specific topic. And today, Amanda uh, Basic from uh, United Medical Clinic is going to be with us. And how are you guys doing? Doing well. Good. All right. So uh, today we are going to cover uh, stress and how it's affecting uh, those patients who have uh, who deal with diabetes. And uh, Amanda is going to give us the clinical presentation. Um, so uh, we can go ahead and start. OK. And is my screen coming through for you? Yeah, perfect. Great. OK, so I'm going to talk about stress management and diabetes. My name is Amanda Bostic. I'm a family nurse practitioner, and I work here at United Medical. So we're going to first start with um, kind of going over, whoops, sorry, going over the objectives. So I'm going to talk a lot about um, the stress cycle and um, and then how that specifically relates to diabetes and your and the effect on your blood sugar, and then kind of go over some ways to manage stress. So let's dive in a little bit deeper here. So there's stress and there's stressors. Okay, so stressors are what kind of activate that stress response in your body. So things that you can hear, taste, smell, um, you know, even just using your imagination um, where you're thinking about something that has maybe happened to you. So we have external stressors, right? So like work, family, um, you know, certainly time crunches, expectations, and then those internal stressors um, that often we don't think about. So some of that like maybe negative self-talk, criticism, maybe some old memories, some old trauma. Um, and then stress is actually just that neurological and physiological chemical response that's happening inside of our body. And that is part of our autonomic nervous system. So our autonomic nervous system is further broken down into two categories. We have our sympathetic nervous system, and then we have our parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system, I always think of like the saber-toothed tiger. That's how it was taught to me in school. So kind of if you see a saber-toothed tiger, What's going on in your body? What are you feeling? Um, and then the parasympathetic nervous system is 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 the opposite of that. So like that rest, relaxation, that kind of sense of well-being um, that we've all hopefully experienced in our life where you can kind of feel a little tingly inside. Okay, so then um, the stress response cycle. So that's our fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And um, so the way I like to uh, kind of think about this is, you know, you see that tiger, right? Then you're going to run for your life. And then you're going to find your friends and fight the tiger, slay the tiger, and then, you know, celebrate. So that's actually taking that whole stress response cycle. So you've had that fight and you've had that flight. Um, and then and then it's kind of come to its natural end. And then there's kind of that good feeling feeling on the other side. Um, another piece of that, um, of a stress response is also that freeze or fawn, which, you know, you may have also experienced in your life where it's just like, you know, almost deer caught in the headlights, kind of, you just freeze. So that's actually all part of this autonomic nervous system. Um, 
And I really love this graphic. It really uh, kind of shows you all the different things that are going on. So when that sympathetic nervous system goes, you know, um, your, your mouth gets a little bit dry, heart rate goes up. Um, you know, the, the sugar, um, the glycogen, which is stored sugar in your liver is converted over to sugar inside of your body. You get in a, a little bit of adrenaline. Um, and then the parasympathetic nervous system is kind of uh, the polar opposite of that, right? So a slowing heart rate, um, you know, the stomach actually starts to digest um, and it's more of that relaxed state. So let's talk a little bit about what is happening when we are having that stress response. So a couple of different hormones that I just wanted to kind of key in on today. So, um, so one of those is the catecholamines, and those are the they're they're secreted by our adrenal glands, and adrenal glands um, are all part of our endocrine system, and they sit on top of our kidneys, and they help regulate. They, they excrete you know this dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. But part of their job is to regulate our blood pressure and, um, and regulate our heart rate. Um, and one of those things is, is epinephrine that's secreted, and that's also known as adrenaline. So just kind of throwing out a couple of different terms that maybe you've heard, but kind of trying to tie that all together for you. Um, and then another hormone are these glucose corticosteroids that, that our body secretes. And what happens when those are secreted, and this is really important with diabetes, is that it will increase that blood sugar. And that's a good thing in, in, in a short um, moment of stress. We, we want that response so that we have enough sugar in our system, enough fuel in our system to actually get us to get up and go. Um, it also, if we do suffer an injury, it will also help and aid in the healing of that injury. Also, part of that is some anti-inflammatories that, um, you know, I'm sure you've you've heard about, you know, somebody having enough strength to pick up, you know, a, a car off of their child if a car drops on them. You know, that adrenaline, also the glucose corticosteroids are in there, and they also um, help to decrease any sort of inflammation that's going to happen to any of the muscles or our body as a protective mechanism. Um, it also is absolutely going to influence our mood, sleep, and behavior. Um, you know, I'm sure if you've had a very stressful day, as, as I'm sure that we all have, that that's absolutely going to affect your sleep as well as how you're going to react to things and your mood. mood. Um, it's also a component of our immune system. And so too much can actually be harmful to our immune system. Um, so I, you know, I, I really just wanted to kind of go over this whole cycle that we can get into with this, um, you know, and short term, obviously, um, if we see a saber tooth tiger, we need to get away and, and that's good. Um, but, but long term, they can have some significant um, effects on us, you know, short term, they're going to make us a lot more alert, um, you know, power to run, you know, the, the, the get up and go to give a presentation like what I'm doing today, manage a traffic jam. Um, but, you know, chronic stress, what can happen is that it's going to increase that blood glucose, which then in turn is going to increase our insulin resistance. Um, and for our type 2 diabetics, um, that's what we're trying not to do, right? That's, that's why that's, that's part of type 2 diabetes that, that we're trying to combat here. So, um, so if this cycle kind of goes unchecked, then we can have worsening insulin resistance, which is just going to kind of kick off this whole cycle here. So now that I've given you all the bad news, let's talk about um, what we can do to kind of counteract some of this, right? So some reasons why maybe we can't complete that whole stress cycle, right? And kind of get to that celebration part. Maybe we're under some chronic stress. Like maybe there's an, a, like a, a coworker that we work with that just is really not compatible with us. And we're just kind of constantly having that stress inside and outside of work in anticipation of, of 
of, of um, having to have an interaction with them. Sometimes it's not appropriate to just burst out and yell at somebody. Um, or if you're taking a test or something like that, you're going to need, um, you, you know, to, to somehow dispel some of that stress cycle. Um, and then maybe it might not be safe. You know, maybe you're not in a safe environment where you can complete that stress cycle. So, you know, let's think about some ways that we can manage these stressors, right? Those internal and external stressors. So, you know, maybe doing some talk therapy can certainly help give you some tools in your tool belt. Maybe having some time to bounce off a, a bad interaction with um, with maybe one of your friends or family members, try to reframe that whole story so that you're actually, um, in a sense, healing yourself so that you're not replaying that same story, causing that same chemical response inside of your body. Um, and then also maybe thinking about setting some boundaries. Um, other ways to manage stress and of course I would encourage everybody watching this to kind of think about like ask yourself that question and and I often ask that of my patients like how do you manage your stress and often I'm given a bunch of blank looks or um you know like what what in the world are you are you asking me um and uh so you know think about that I, I would challenge you to think about that you know for for me personally walking and a meditative practice is what I found that works for me it's something that I love to do other ways to manage stress are um you know any sort of cardio workout. Um, and, you know, for diabetes and just for good cardiovascular health, we encourage everybody to do about 30 minutes more days out of the week than not. So at least five days out of the week, I would love to see you doing some sort of um, aerobic exercise. You know, another way that you could manage the stress after a long day is maybe turning on the music in your kitchen while you're making a good nutritious meal for yourself and dancing and singing, you know, sometimes maybe you just might need a good cry and that's okay too. Um, and um, maybe you also just need a hug, maybe some, some affection whether, and, and if that's um, not possible for you, you know, if, if you, if you live alone, then maybe, you know, snuggling with your dog or, you know, having, having time with your pets. Um, but certainly I, I, I encourage everybody to kind of think about how, how you best manage stress. So I'm going to do a little, um, a uh, little mindful meditation. So, um, so I encourage everybody uh, here to kind of play along with me for a minute. Um, you know, it's been, it's uh, mindful meditation has gotten a lot of media attention more recently, I would say in probably the past 10 years. And really the, the whole idea is that you're just bringing your awareness to your breath and to the present moment. Um, and, uh, you know, I find that that the more that you practice that, the the easier it is. It's almost like a reflex, and, and easier it, the easier it becomes for you to kind of come into that state. So I'm just going to take you through a little uh, guided meditation. So again, if you all will just play along with me here. So I encourage you to just kind of get yourself comfortable in your seat, close your eyes. And then I want us all to just take a big deep breath in through our nose and then a nice sigh out our mouth. So and maybe if you make a little noise, that can help too. So we're going to do that again. Nice big deep breath in and then let it out through your mouth. And then I just want you to take a moment or two here and sit and Continue to breathe, maybe put your hands on your belly and feel that air come in and out of your body. And just try to focus in on your breath and just your breath alone. Now, of course, your mind is going to wander as, as it always does. And the moment that you notice that it's wandered, that's a victory. That's a wonderful thing um, that, that's bringing you right back in the present moment. 
And so you just, just this one breath, just this one, one breath, one breath in, one breath out. I'll let you have another minute or two. And then one nice big final breath in and out. And what I find when I when I practice mindful meditation and when I teach patients how to do mindful meditation is that it really can bring such a sense profound sense of well-being um, and really the sense that that all of our needs are being met right now um, and it, it 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 really it's like huh okay, <laughs> helps me reframe how, how I'm going to approach my day. Um, you know, the more that you practice this, um, you know, the, the, the easier it's going to become. Um, but just like anything, practice is going to make perfect. So, um, so in conclusion, uh, you know, this stress response is absolutely going to happen. Hopefully it doesn't happen many more times for the rest of your day. Um, but I want you to think about how you can complete it. Um, try to exercise daily. Maybe it's time to set some boundaries. Um, and then just try to incorporate a daily mindful practice and start small. Just start with three minutes a day. Um, and we can always find three minutes somewhere. That's it. Amanda, thank you. Um, so... Mm -hmm. The mindful meditation uh, it always reminds me of the way that um, religious uh, practices, like you know, if you if you kind of think about it, so a lot of the religions they do have those times set for you know prayers and other things where you are kind of you have to kind of focus on just that. Uh, I think the idea of um, being able to uh, get away from other things and just focus on that that practice is there. Uh, and just from so many different uh, backgrounds, I know so many different people are practicing in different ways, but there's one common thing is you are just focusing on that moment and nothing else. So uh, now this breathing uh, exercise, actually, I did read about that maybe two years ago. Um, there were a couple of studies. So like many people really don't know how to breathe. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um, when even like for not just for the managing the stress but like uh, if you are a tennis player if you don't breathe right like if like when you hit the ball um, your uh, inhale exhale is important so it goes with um, uh, your game gets better if your breathing is better so mm -hmm. if any of your breathing is uh, proper so uh, so this is affecting so many different things um, and uh, I think you did a great job explaining uh, how you can um, how we can actually prevent the stress so that, uh, because diabetes is not never by itself, right? So diabetes comes with so many different comorbidities. And we know that uh, many people um, who have diabetes, they also have hypertension, they also have hyperlipidemia, they have uh, cardiac issues, uh, morbid obesity, and all those when it comes all together, uh, you know, the stress makes almost kind of like uh, leads into um, anxiety and uh, maybe it can become like the chronic depression at some point if, if it's not managed properly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, one of the other things that I always tell, uh, get a puppy um, so then you'll walk more. Uh, you know, right now, uh, you know, Joshua is almost uh, 15 months. Uh, there was a time, there are three months that I didn't have, uh, I didn't have a pup. Um, and the walk is kind of like, um, it's it's the best way to kind of get away from everything else. Mm -hmm. And I, it's forcing you to do it. So if, if I didn't have that need, uh, like if I, if I uh, you feel guilty if you don't walk in. So Absolutely. I'm pushing myself, even if I'm tired, I have a reason to get out. So, um, and also they do help you with other uh, it's things that, you know, like with the emotions and uh, like being able to have someone there uh, always available, uh, pays attention, you know, except when they eat uh, shoes and other stuff. Um, so, but it really, it's, it does help a lot of people. Um, and because physical activity is one of the, uh, uh, probably one of the uh, main issues that I see with so many different uh, disease management. So, mm -hmm. 
just 30 minute walk is going to make a huge difference. Um, so, uh, but I, uh, there's there's more, much more, more to learn from your presentation. And thank you. Um, I know Caroline is going to cover the uh, nutrition part of this. Uh, do you have your PowerPoint or? Um, I have it open if you'd prefer me to do the slides. Yeah, if, if you can. Just um, bear, bear with me for a second as I share my screen. Can you give me access to share the screen? Yep, you should be good now. Perfect. Okay. So. All right, so let me find my part. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right, so how do I get out of this view? Technology is not my friend today, but... <laughs> um, do you have a dual screen right now? I do, I do. Okay, so you're going to minimize the one that has the uh, info, and I think you'll go with the other screen. Um, okay. So did you share both screens? Uh, yes, let me see if I can do this one. Okay. How does that look? Okay, this is good now. <laughs> Wait, you can see my screen, and is it just the PowerPoint? Just, just the PowerPoint. Okay, there we go. I got it. All right, so give me one minute, three minutes. All right, you can all see the PowerPoint, correct? Yes, we are good. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to touch on some things that I hear often in counseling that tend to cause a little bit of stress and anxiety. And it's mostly around meal planning, especially when we have new diagnoses for diabetes, especially. Um, diabetes can cause a little bit of apprehension and wanting to eat and not knowing what to eat and how to um, plan out a meal for yourself. I think I often get the question, can't you just make me a meal plan? And while I wish we all could make every single patient a meal plan to follow time constraints, and that's a, a lot of things to do for every single patient. So we try to set you up with the tools and techniques to form your own type of meal plan that fits you and your family's needs. Um, so we're going to go through five steps for meal planning with diabetes today. And we'll start with why meal planning? So I always strongly feel connected to the Snickers commercial that says you're not you when you're hungry. Um, that's normally how I feel. And it's very true when you're trying to find what to eat when you are very hungry. Usually we don't end up making the best, most balanced options, which is completely normal because you're just trying to get energy to, to fuel your day. Um, but even going grocery shopping when you haven't eaten, I know I'm always tempted at the end of the aisles when I just find some, that looks good. That looks good. And then you end up with things you don't necessarily need or didn't intend on buying. So when we meal plan, we have things prepared. So we're more likely to milk, make healthy, more health conscious decisions on what we're having. Uh, maybe a little more balanced and in including different food items, uh, a lower cost because you are purchasing less things, right? Because you have a list, you know exactly what you're having for that week. Um, it can save you lots and lots of time. So I think there's been many times when the time that it took us to discuss what we were going to eat, I could have prepped a meal by then. So then it gives you some extra time in your night and that kind of helps to relieve some stress. An argument saver, um, some disagreements can come on what you're going to eat. I know, especially if you're like, what do you want to eat tonight? It goes back and forth, um, especially in our household. And then less food waste to also focus on. So a lot of the time we might not even use what's in our pantry and end up throwing food out. And I know, especially in a time when we're trying to save on food costs, um, meal prepping can be a way that we use what we have and not have to throw out any extra that we didn't, especially with the produce, because a lot of produce looks good, but if you don't have a way to use it, it ends up in the garbage, um, which can be kind of sad. Um, so all these areas help us stress less. So our job is to focus on how can we plan some meals to help us um, lower our stress. So our first step that I always walk through with patients is we pick a specific day of the week to plan out your meals. So we want to base it on when you're going to do your shopping, right? Do you want to um, shop on Tuesdays and then, or plan your meal on Tuesdays and shop on Thursdays? Does it depend on the sale of your grocery store? 
So if you pick a specific day of the week you want to focus on, um, like I'm going to have dinner for Wednesday and Thursday because I don't have time to cook anything super extensive, right? That can help us navigate the rest of the week. So step one, pick a specific day of the week um, and kind of base it on when you're going to do your shopping. Our step two is to choose the day of the week and what meal you're planning. Um, I always recommend starting really small first. So especially if you're not into the meal planning aspect of things, we don't wanna say let's plan every meal of every day for the whole week, cause that's gonna add stress to your life. So we wanna start with something really attainable. We call them smart goals that it's measurable, time sensitive. Um, so pick a day and a meal. So for instance, I'm going to meal plan for Tuesday and Thursday, but I'm only going to do dinner. I'm going to start there. And then if that goes well, you could work on lunch and later on add more meals. But starting small is the best way to go. Um, you can go a couple different ways with deciding things for meal planning. You can decide if you're going to prep the day of, like you just come up with the meal idea and the recipe and have it ready to go with the ingredients. Or some people meal prep all on Sunday for the entire week um, for their lunches or their dinners or their, even their breakfast. So you can use whatever works best for you. In our house, we usually do the meal idea because we're, I'm not a leftover fan. I like to have it freshly made. So it's depending on what works for you and your schedule. You also want to check with your family. Um, a lot of the times, a way to avoid, you know, not eating certain foods is to discuss with your family what is going to work for the week, what meals, what's your schedule look like? Is Wednesday busy? Do we need something quick? Um, that can help you kind of plan out what days you need meal planning most. Um, and then make it exciting, right? So do some researching. There are some great recipe books, um, online recipes. Um, to keep things interesting. Um, we have a Pinterest page that we recommend to all our patients um, that we use in our nutrition counseling. Um, all the dietitians work on, we try to do it weekly, but saving new recipes that we find. I like to save ones that I've tried before. Um, we have vegetarian, diabetes focus, bariatric focus, um, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, just to give you some ideas. And these are customizable. So just because it's written in stone on someone's blog does not mean you have to follow it, but they're just things to get you thinking about, oh, I would really like this kind of dish to be a part of our week. Um, so feel free to get creative with what kind of meals you are picking. Um, there are also meal planning services. So if you find you're not much of a cook and you don't really love it and you don't have the time for it, um, and it makes more sense to follow a meal planning service, there are things like Blue Apron. I know Donna uses Blue Apron um, a couple of times and she really likes it. Um, HelloFresh, there are certainly good ways to find a, a diabetes focused um, balanced recipe on there that you can make and they just give you the instructions there. So that's always something to explore if it's interesting to you. Um, our step three is to take inventory of your kitchen. Um, I'm notorious for missing, missing this step. So I always try to preach it too. So I remind myself when you're creating your list, look in your pantry. What do you already have? Do you already have the rice? Do you already have the beans ready? Um, this can help you save money and, and make not make unnecessary purchases that you don't need. Um, you can also save money by creating your recipe around what you already have, right? So I have tons of um, whole grain rice in my in my pantry, right? I can search on the internet or I can search on Pinterest boards, um, brown rice recipe for dinner, right? And you'll get a bunch of different options that you can find what looks interesting to you. Um, so that's how you can kind of navigate using your own pantry, um, making your grocery list a little bit smaller, but also using what you have to prevent that food waste. And then our step four is create our shopping list. So um, you can do it virtually, paper, I'm a paper and pen kind of person. Um, but I think the thing to decide is, are you shopping in the store? Are you doing mobile order or grocery pickup? That's one of the best things I think came out of COVID was grocery pickup and mobile order. It saves so much time. So if timing is a thing for you and that's a stressor in meal planning itself, um, online grocery orders are great because you can visually see all your ingredients. You can see the cost adding up prevents unnecessary, for some people, it prevents unnecessary buying. Um, for me, I don't end up, if I go in the store, I will pick up things I don't need. So it's helpful depending on how you're uh, shopping, how you shop normally. Um, so decide that, and then you can decide whether to create on the app, on the grocery app, your list, or you can paper and pen it and go through the grocery aisle and find what you need um, for the recipes for the week. And our step five is it's time to cook. 
So whether you prepare your meals ahead of time or you make them the night before, schedule the time you're going to do it. That's the important part. If you just keep putting it off and saying, I'm going to eventually get to it, it's not going to work because we need to be super specific about it if we're going to eliminate the stress for it. So like Sundays, if you're prepping meals for the week, Sunday afternoons are when we're going to do it. If you're prepping the night of, right, you have that night, that time where you're going to create that dinner recipe. Um, if you're using the meal idea, the meal idea route, like um, you are having an Asian flair meal for Tuesday night's dinner, and you're not really feeling, you know, that kind of taste for that night, you can switch it. So that's the fun part of the meal ideal route is you don't have to lock into a recipe for that night. You just have choices for what ingredients that you have. Um, I know a lot of the times I'll have like taco Tuesdays or things like that. And sometimes on Tuesdays, I don't want tacos. So we'll switch it for something else that we had ready for the week. Um, so something else we get into a little bit of discussion about in counseling is what kind of recipe is right for me? How do I know if a recipe is right for my diabetes? How am I supposed to find a recipe online that's going to give me everything I need? How do I know if it's healthy? My quick answer is all of them are. You can absolutely make all foods fit in any situation, right? There's no food you have to specifically avoid, but we work on ratios. We work on what are our goals for the meal, right? As you can see on the slide, we've got our, our my plate action of low carbohydrate vegetables, starchy um, grains, and um, starchy vegetables on the side for the smallest portion. And then we've got that protein as, you know, the fourth of the plate too, to help balance out our carbs. So it's all coming down to the, what ratio are you using? Um, you can eat the same food as your family. So we run into the issue of, of, uh, patients being worried. I don't want to create six different meals for the family. If I can't have what they're having, um, you can eat whatever they're having. You just see what can you add to the meal? Can you add an extra protein? If it's homemade pizza night, can you add grilled chicken on the side? Can you use whole wheat flour for the family? Can you add your vegetable to the side too? Um, so really these, these recipes and things are customizable and there doesn't have to be a lot of stress created around. Is this a healthy recipe? Because you can always improve on a recipe that you find. Um, we talk a lot about focusing on fibers, fats, and proteins to slow down the carbohydrate digestion so that you have a better blood sugar result. Um, so adding those things to the meal, even if the meal didn't start out with those things can really benefit you in the end. So in our summary, um, just to wrap things up, uh, meal planning can be stressful. I know we've all probably had debates on what to eat for dinner, lunch, breakfast, um, and stress can impact our health and especially our diabetes. If we're so worried about the numbers and the foods and the things that stress helps, that stress raises um, in our blood sugar raises as well. So designating a specific time to talk with family, plan ahead, um, can make eating enjoyable, but it can also make um, room for saving time, saving money, um, and just remembering that all foods fit. So not being afraid of trying new things, we can balance our blood sugars with any recipe. And um, we just really need to ask ourselves, the main question is what can I add to this meal and how can we use it to balance our blood sugars? And that is it. All right, uh, Caroline, thank you. Uh, it's always um, very useful um, uh, for you to go through these. Um, and there's always something to pick up uh, from these presentations. You know, um, and I think Amanda, uh, her connection, I'm not sure if uh, there was an issue. Uh, she dropped out, or maybe she has patience. Okay. I don't know. Maybe she'll, maybe she'll come back. Um, <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> she got stressed out. So like from, yeah, presenting, she was saying that. So one of the things that I picked up, uh, when we look at what makes us uh, stressed, like what uh, contributes to the uh, stressful um, mindset is like one of the most important one is, is the financial concerns. As you know, in these um, weekly events, we cover um, uh, other topics, uh, especially at the 2 p.m. one. And uh, just an interesting um, statistic that I just want to share with uh, you and Sean actually just joined us. Well, he was here, but he just joined us. Um, so, you know, how the economy can impact uh, what uh, happens to us. And uh, for the small changes that may be happening, and we think that it's small, but then we realize that they're not actually so small. For example, when the when average person uh, household, if let's say they have three hundred thousand uh, dollars mortgage, um, 
just two years ago, this uh, household was paying 3.5% uh, 30-year fixed uh, rate, and their monthly payment was $1,350. And that number uh, with today's um, uh, interest rates it's about like i took uh, at seven percent more than seven right now but mm -hmm. that's about two thousand dollars so you you think that it's a very small change the, the interest is going from 3.5 to seven but that impacts uh especially for those who are you know getting new houses and or refinancing uh they end up paying 48 percent more uh on their monthly uh payments which can bring a lot of um uh pressure on that uh households uh you know day-to-day -day life um so that's you know like we try to kind of uh, kind of tie everything into the healthcare so like sometimes we discuss like the different things with the politics and this and that but the main thing it always comes down to what we do day to day and uh, how it's affecting our life so when we look at these disease um uh, managements uh, and then when we when we actually talk about stress being one of the biggest um, uh, issues that we deal with because this leads into the depression again uh, the anxiety depression which is the most one of the most common uh, chronic illnesses these days uh, so the financial issues are right out there and and then I see a lot of elderly now they are picking up second jobs or they are picking up part time jobs sorry not second job but a part time job after they retire because. They need um, more yeah. income for everything else is changing. So uh, one of the other thing that I wanted to point out, I guess, uh, being able to uh, prepare what's coming uh, financially or emotionally is probably the best way to also prevent uh, the stress, uh, especially in these uh, situations. As I mentioned earlier, with the chronic um, uh, issue that many people think. Uh, working out is not going to the gym and killing yourself for two hours 30 minutes uh walk is going to do a lot a lot a lot for your body and for your mind so we do want people to uh, kind of remember those and hopefully uh, we can uh, reach out to more people to um uh, be their voice and be their guide uh in terms of uh, how they're managing their uh, issues and their uh different crowd problems. So uh, anything you would like to add, Caroline or uh, Sean? Um, one of the things that I find very, very helpful along with her guided breathing, um, yoga is really great. And there's yoga for every age, every capability, um, chair yoga. It goes through the breathing and the motion of your body as well to release tension in your muscles. Because sometimes the breathing, you know, it works really well, but you have tension in other areas in your body that's hard to release. So um, I find yoga and practice, it also helps with digestion, helps with blood sugar. So um, I found that to be very, very beneficial. Absolutely. absolutely. So, um, well, anything that's keeping us more uh, active, um, it's it's helpful. So uh, I know you probably have patients, so you, I know you need to go, but um, we'll have a couple other topics that we are going to discuss. And we have bariatric Friday at 3 p.m. Uh, and we are going to discuss the day of bariatric surgery. So. Um, Hopefully, uh, uh, everyone is able to follow. Um, all right, so thank you, Caroline. Thanks. All right, Mr. Donovan, how are you doing? Doing well, how are you? Good. Um, so we have uh, we have different uh, topics today, mm -hmm. but we don't have a lot of time. So yeah, um, we just touch uh, briefly. Yeah, uh, so we can uh, one of the do you want to start with the MSSP or do you want to start with the uh, rest so of the world? They're actually tied in together in the same video. So whichever okay. one, um, or maybe the MSSP is probably uh, more yes. novel. So while, while what's running on the video right now, so let's actually discuss that. So we are uh, trying to kind of point out the issues um, globally, right? So uh, global uh, conflict uh, tracker, there's actually an app uh, you can download um, and it tells you what's happening and what levels um do you want to kind of tell yeah, us yeah so um i know we've touched on this in prior sessions like months ago even probably over a year ago um but as you mentioned the global uh conflict tracker it's just the main larger ones you'll see in the global news obviously there's much numerous smaller ones going on across the globe they can't keep track of all of them but these are the highlights uh probably make you know breaking news type thing um and as you mentioned it does kind of 
track the severity, whether the crisis is improving, remain the same or getting worse, and also the impact it has on the US, whether we're immediately you know, involved in it or if it'll have like a ripple effect impact. Um, but some of the ones we had here, which we did mention on, um, obviously the war with Ukraine and Russia is in there. We have the Israeli-Palestine conflict, as well as China-Taiwan. Um, and then we also have what's going on in Pakistan um, with the India-Pakistan border uh, mm -hmm. dispute there. So these are just some of the ones that we picked out. Again, on this app, it probably has about 25 section. Um, because it's kind of important um, what we have there. Um, so then we can kind of go on the global issues. Uh, last week, we discussed the BRICS um, and what's happening with sure. um, the new countries joining BRICS and how that's going to change the dynamics uh, in the global currency. Uh, now, these uh, global conflicts are important, as you mentioned, for the reasons that we already know, but there are other things that uh, other long term impacts of these. Um, mm -hmm. uh, some of them are immediate ones that we, we are going to see, but some of them are, uh, they are not. You know, visible yeah. yet, but they will be. Uh, there will be more uh, coming. Mm -hmm. So this may be um, the worst thing is like any of these uh, getting in, getting out of control, um, because like yeah. those countries with the nuclear weapons, so that can actually uh, right. become a, a big. Um, uh, it can jeopardize everyone's lives. Mm -hmm. So uh, and then who's actually responsible? Uh, to make those decisions is just like the uh, yeah. the biggest concern that That's, many people have, right? Yeah. So I know we mentioned other sessions with like the EU, um, and kind of who has the say in there, and some of the countries in there. I was there, you know, in arguments or disagreements with each other, um, and those handful of countries that you mentioned that have that, why they are the ones uh, elected to have that final say, right? Their voice heard versus other countries. We know that was kind of the reason why some of the countries in Africa were being upset because decisions are being made regarding them by countries who obviously don't, you know, see that day to day impact. Um, and what you're saying though too is, a lot of these conflicts do take you know even decades to unravel and to finally get that full impact, whether it's positive or negative. And obviously, um, if you're talking about something with nuclear weapons and you don't want them to obviously spiral out of control. You don't want a country to feel like they have no other option. Um, I know that was a big thing with the run for Ukraine, right. where you want to have them back into a corner where you're threatening to use the... Well, but you know, is that uh, the uh, possibility of that's happening is there. So oh, definitely. It's not like it won't happen. So we look at the history and then look at uh, every other big um, disaster that we have. Someone was responsible. So yeah. now where we are uh, in terms of um, uh, like the world societies and uh, if we can, can we repeat some of those mistakes? Uh, we are definitely capable of uh, oh, yeah. repeating those mistakes. So, uh, well, we'll see. Uh, we, we, wanna, we do want to report on these because that's helping us to kind of uh, better understand what's coming. Um, and the, the well, next week, um, uh, we'll cover the MSSP and um, our uh, other topics. Now we have a couple of uh, confirmed guests. Yep. Um, so we still have um, Coyote Abagunde, or State Insurance Commissioner. Yep. Um, he's joining us at the beginning of October. And also yesterday I was actually um, speaking with Dr. Michael Katz, who's running for U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. um, we spoke for about a half hour or so on the phone uh, regarding him joining us uh, in the future. So we do have uh, both of them. Uh, agreed and are definitely interested in joining, um, as well as a couple others that we're still uh, in the talks with. But um, we have uh, Bethany uh, Hall and Sarah McBride right. and Lisa Rochester. They will be uh, definitely with us. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but we were trying to get others prior to them. Yeah, so then, people who yeah. would be new to the show, get them uh, a chance, but yeah. And Mr. Vivek is, uh, I actually just emailed him again directly this time. So. Okay. Uh, because I think his team is not not doing maybe, a good job. Yeah, so, maybe swamp. Yeah. So, uh, well, we'll be back with so many uh, other updates and so many other uh, guests who are going to join us uh, in the next several weeks. Uh, in ten minutes, we have Bariatric Friday. Uh, Doctor Irgal, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is going to join us, and we'll cover the day of bariatric surgery. What patients can expect. 
uh, on that day, and uh, so we'll try to prep the patients yeah, for I those. Think, I think it'd be interesting too to see his uh, take on what stress maybe impact well, them on day of surgery. The, too. Those, those patients do go through a lot of stress, even like even prior to the surgery, uh, they already have uh, the, you know different level of um, psychological issues uh, comes with morbid obesity, but many of them are having that uh, surgery stress. So then uh, like they're uh, yeah, kind of anxious yeah. on one hand, but the other side, like they're kind of like uh, worried. So that's why uh, we kind of want to prep them in the best way. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing, I uh, just think about it. Like uh, this used to be when I, uh, when I was fully involved with bariatric surgery in 2012 in terms of the management. So we go all the way back to 2003, but the management uh, part of it was 12. So that's almost 10 years, right? So in the beginning, this was a major, major surgery where you have to stay in the hospital one or two days. And in the hospital program, they still keep the patient for at least a day. Mm -hmm. Now, with our uh, screening process, with the way that we prep our patients and uh, having the best um, from the surgeons to the medical staff, nursing, uh, nurses, care coordinators, mm -hmm. we are able to make the process so uh, safe that now 100% of our patients are discharged from six to seven hours from, from their uh, operation. So everyone goes home at the end of the day. So yeah. if you think about from that point, so it's not. That's definitely a big, yeah. big strides. And for that also, just knowing that, having that assurance, reassurance, may help calm them, make them feel more comfortable, mm -hmm. help impact that stress lower down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, uh, thank you everyone. And we'll be back in.